Amen. Uh, my sermon this morning is titled Mindset. And it goes through the chapter of John chapter 9 as we are going through the book of John uh, in this series. We are parked here in John chapter 9 and throughout this entire chapter as I was reading it and studying it uh, for the last two weeks uh, getting ready for this sermon, I couldn't help but think about this book that was written uh, back, I believe it was 2006, but it's called Mindset. And this book is written by a, a professor. Uh, <clears throat> she's a professor at Stanford, and her name is Carol Dweck. Now, how I actually came upon this book is I want to share with you all just a little tidbit of my life. Did you know that when I was in Dallas and I was in the middle of planting our church, I was thinking of ways of growing our church and our footprint in the city of Dallas. And one thing that came to my footsteps, my doorstep, is I actually got an opportunity to become a Chick-fil-A manager. I kid you not. I'm really serious about this. Like corporate in Chick-fil-A, I knew a friend that knew the corporate head office of Chick-fil-A in Georgia, and they actually interviewed me, and I went through the final interview process. And during the entire interview process, Chick-fil-A has, um, I don't know if I should be able to say this, you know, out loud in public since it's recorded online, but one of the things that you had to do to become an operator at Chick-fil-A was you had to read this book, Mindset. This is how I became to know this book. And I studied this book for the interview, and I was all ready, and I actually passed the interview. And then finally, the last question of the interview at Chick-fil-A, they asked me the question, would you be willing to give up your church, you know, running the church on a Sunday? Would you give it to somebody else to manage so that you can manage one of our stores in Dallas? And um, I gotta say, at that moment, I wanted to say, yes, I can give it up, but uh, truth prevailed. And I said, no, I can't give up my church. And so um, they said, then we're going to have to look somewhere else to find a manager because uh, all of our managers have to be all in. That's what they said at Chick-fil-A. Uh, so I gave up six figures, <laughs> six figure salary at Chick-fil-A uh, to continue uh, planting our church, which uh, after three years, uh, we had to shut it down. But um, it's brought me here, right? If I was a Chick-fil-A manager, I'd, I'd probably sla be slaving away. But the whole book of mindset, the whole, this whole book, if I can just sum it up for each and every one of you here this morning, it really is about this professor challenging her readers to say, do you have a fixed mindset or do you have a growth mindset? And her whole proposition is that there are people in this world who have this fixed mentality. Like they, they believe what they believe and they're never going to change. They're never going to change. You can think of this person as a person with a clenched fist, a closed fist. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I know what's right. I know what's best for everyone. That's a person who has a fixed mindset, the close-fisted person. And then there's the other person that Carol Dweck is trying to say in her book. She's saying, do we possess an open mindset? Somebody whose hand is not closed in a fist, but open, saying, questioning things like, maybe I don't know everything. What can I learn from this situation? How can I become better? And unless you have a growth mindset, you'll always stay in this fixed mindset where you have your fists clenched and you say to everybody else, oh, I know what, I, I know what I'm doing. I have the best solution. I know what's best. Those people are described as fixed mindset. And one of the reasons why Chick-fil-A wanted to make sure every person, every operator operated with 
a open mindset was many of the, actually, if you study Chick-fil-A, you'll realize that many of the innovations that they created as a corporation, as a company, and why they're growing so much is because all of their operators come with a growth mindset with an open hand saying, you know what? How can I be better? How can I learn from this? How can I uh, take advantage of this situation? So it's, it's quite interesting. If you go deeper into the levels of Chick-fil-A operations, you'll find out that they, they test everything from food to drive-throughs to wait times to all these different things. Uh, Chick-fil-A was one of the first restaurants, I don't know if you know, that started having people wait outside to take their orders through the iPad. They were the one of the first. And that actually comes from a growth mindset where their hands are open and they're saying, how can we better serve our community? Why do I talk about this and why am I asking this church, why am I asking all of you to the question to ask throughout the entire chapter of chapter 9 is this question. Do we possess a fixed mindset or do we possess a growth mindset? For centuries, there was a pervasive mindset in the Jewish culture that if something bad happened to you or even your children, that it was because the, the root problem was because there was sin in your life. That's the way they explain things. So if your child was born with a deformity, if your child was blind or deaf or lame or mute, they would explain it to the people as saying, you know what, there has to be something wrong that your great-grandmother did. Or maybe your great-grandfather did something wrong. Maybe your parents, maybe you sinned. And that's why you have a child like this. This is the way they thought. This is the way the Jewish cultural norms were back in Jesus' time. And we actually see this played out in the Scripture when we open up our Bible verse to John chapter 9. It's not only the Pharisees and the leaders of the law that understood this, it was every Jewish person that had this mindset. Let's take a look as we open up our Bibles to John chapter 9 and we look at verse 1 through 5. As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents, who sinned? Was it this man? or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus' answer was, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We can clearly see by the question that the disciples are asking Jesus, we can see that by their question, we see what their inner hearts were really filled with, what their thoughts were. The disciples assumed that this man, because he had a handicap, because he was blind, that there must be some underlying reason or some underlying sin either from him, the, the blind person, or his parents that caused this blindness. And to this form of thinking, this closed mindset, Jesus addresses the truth that it's actually none of these reasons. The man who was born blind, it wasn't because the parents sinned, and it wasn't even because he himself had sinned. But he answers it by looking, let's look at, let's take a closer look at verses 3 and 4. Jesus states that neither this man nor his parents sinned. 
But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, before we move on, I just want to share with you all that as we read these two verses, many times we too, because of our cultural norms, because of the way we think, we actually misunderstand and misinterpret these two verses. When we read these two verses, we think in American society, in, in American society where the ends justify the means, we Usually, we usually read this passage as Jesus saying, the man was purposely born blind by God so that God may perform a miraculous sign through him. Do you see how we kind of think like God purposely made this man blind so that God can revive him and heal him and make a big show about himself? Uh, that couldn't be farther from the truth. We're going to take a look. The reason why we think like this is because of the way the punctuation marks are put in the NIV. In, in the English translation from the Greek to the English, we put commas and parentheses and uh, places in places where they sometimes shouldn't be. And so to give a great example about this, when people translate from one language to another how things are lost in translation, let me show you this article, this, uh, this cover of Tales magazine, December 2010. Read that cover. Eat, Ray, love. Back in 2010, Rachel Ray was everything. She had her own line. She had her own like pots and pans. She was everywhere, all over the TV. And so this, uh, this cover of the magazine says, Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. Uh, <laughs> in some parts of the world, ladies and gentlemen, where dogs are actually eaten, no one would be surprised by this caption. But here in America, and especially in Colorado, where dogs are very much loved and considered part of the family, guys, this is where commas, parentheses, conjunctions, all of these things come into play. The importance of punctuation is that this is the way this title should have really been read. Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking, comma, her family, comma, and her dog. That's the way this uh, title should have been put, with commas. But take out those commas, and the sentence becomes an entirely different sentence with a different meaning. In the same way, in John chapter, in this chapter, what I just showed you in verses 3, where Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. This is actually in the Greek a very long run-on sentence. And because in the Greek they had no punctuation marks, they didn't, they didn't uh, dissect this. And what Greek, scholars under, uh, what Greek scholars call this is called the henna clause. Now, I'm not going to go all into that. I'm just going to share with you that when you look at the Greek and you see how it should be translated into the American language, it should be read as this. But so that the work of God might be displayed in this man's life, we must do the work of him who sent me while it is still day. See, Jesus is not trying to explain to the disciples, hey, this man sinned, and so that so the glory of God, so that the glory of God may be seen, we're going to heal this man. That's why he was born blind. He doesn't even give a reason why this man was born blind. 
What Jesus is trying to say to his disciples is he's trying to say, guys, don't focus on whose fault it is that this man is blind. Don't, you're focusing on the wrong thing. The focus should be that while we are here in this world, we need to help others. We need to bless others. Because the truth of the matter is, we were all born in God's wonderful image, but something along the lines with sin and everything that creeped into this world, this world is not what it should be. This world is not the way God intended it to be. And it's not God who, who zaps people and saying, well, you did wrong, then you're going to be blind. Well, your parents sinned, well, then you're going to be lame. God doesn't do that. He's not this cosmic killjoy up in heaven thinking, oh, who am I going to make suffer today so that my glory may be seen? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying to his disciples is, you guys have the wrong mindset. The issue is not about who did the wrong. The issue is, are we here to bring the healing? And what Jesus is trying to say is, I have come to be the light of the world. Yes, in a world where things are wrong, in a world where sin is rampant, yes, in a world where suffering is insufferable, and it's, there's just so many things with wars, even right now with Ukraine, with the war that's happening there, and all the things that are happening in the U.S., the fears of inflation, the fears of being able to live another day, the fear, the problem of homelessness. There's so many things. And so let's not, let's not park ourselves in trying to figure out who did the wrong. Let's try to make a difference in this world by healing those people who are hurting. That's what Jesus came here for, and that is what Jesus does. The next verse, verse 6. After saying this, Jesus spits on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Shiloam, which this word means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. Jesus heals the man who was born blind. And he does it during this Feast of Tabernacles, which I, I don't know if you remember, but two weeks ago when I preached about the significance of this feast, it was the Feast of Lights. It was the Festival of Lights. And Jesus comes throughout this festival and he announces to everybody, I am the light of the world. And in me, there is no one who will walk in darkness, but through me, people will walk in the light. And now he actually shows what he is saying by putting mud on the man's eyes and telling him, go now wash in that pool of Shiloam. And as he goes and washes his face and the mud off of his eyes, he opens his eyes for the first time in his life, remember because he was born blind, he opens his eyes and he is able to see. This is the power of Jesus. But the rest of this chapter, it's quite interesting. This power of Jesus being able to be the light of the world is met with a lot of opposition. And this is the second part of my sermon is how I will end. It's, it's a little long, so I ask for your patience to uh, <clears throat> bear with me as I read the rest of this chapter. But as I read this chapter, take a look at the attitude of the leaders of the Jewish church, of the Jerusalem church. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees this man who had been blind. Now on the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. 
Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, the guy answered, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, they're talking about Jesus, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. Hey, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The blind man replied, he is a prophet. But they still did not believe that he had been born blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he is our son, the parents answer. And we know that he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, a second time, they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of him opening, uh, of her, Sorry, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this day replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Oof. I know this, is a, this was a long passage. But as you can see, as we read over and over and over again, these Jewish leaders, what was their problem, everyone? They all saw a miracle being performed right in front of their eyes. They had the proof right in front of them. But what was their problem? You all know it inside your hearts, right? They couldn't believe it. They could not understand. They were like, how did this man who, by the way, what is their biggest issue? Their biggest issue is that Jesus on a Sabbath, meaning on their sa Saturday, they used to worship Sabbath, uh, observe the Sabbath on a Saturday. On a Saturday, Jesus decides to spit on the ground, take that spit, rub it in his hands, and put it on the eyes of this blind man. That was their problem. On the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to do anything. 
You weren't supposed to move. You weren't supposed to touch certain things. You weren't supposed to do any of that stuff. And they got so mad that Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath that they just could not understand how can God work through a man like this who is blatantly, blatantly um, disobeying the Sabbath. What was their problem? They had a fixed mindset. They had an attitude. They had this thought process that the Sabbath was not, uh, that the Sabbath was a day that they shouldn't do this, 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 and this. And they made their Sabbath day into a day of rituals that must be observed. But what they couldn't understand was that God created the Sabbath so that people can rest in Him. That was why the Sabbath was made. But instead, they used their traditions and their cultural norms and the way they've been brought up all of their lives. They said, oh no, God would never work like this. God could never work like that. And they totally disregarded the work of God, even though it was right in front of their eyes. And that is why at the end, the irony of Jesus' summary statement in this chapter is found in verse 39. Jesus finishes this entire discourse of arguing back and forth and how did he do this and all this stuff. And Jesus says this, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Do you see the irony of Jesus' statement in this chapter? Those who were handicapped with physical blindness, they were so desperate that they, were, that, that they had the humility to live with open hands, trusting the Lord's process to open their eyes. But on the other side, you had these people with closed fists who are difficult to lead. By the way, have you ever tried to lead a child with a closed fist? It's impossible. It's impossible to lead anyone who has a closed fist and says, oh, I know what's right. I know what's best for me. Have you ever tried to tell anyone to change their mind from somebody who has that closed mindset? Well, that was the Pharisees. And although they can physically see with their eyes, it was their, it was their pride that they felt that they knew what was right. It was their pride that made them have that closed fist. And Jesus, no matter what miracle he did, he couldn't lead them. They didn't want to be led. They wanted to believe that they were right. Yet this man, the only person who had a handicap in this entire chapter, look at everyone from the, from the disciples to the Pharisees, even to the parents. The parents didn't want to share, you know, uh, they didn't want to testify against the, the Jerusalem church. You know why? Because, and it says in the scripture, it said because they were afraid of being kicked out. They were afraid. This is why I'll end today's sermon with this. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, says this. Therefore, I truly tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. What was he saying? What is it about children that he used children as the greatest example of people who are able to enter into the kingdom? You know, my seminary professor, Dr. Hendricks, once said, everyone, students, the day you stop learning is the day you start dying. I remember that. I'll never forget that. And he said, everyone, students, always be in the posture of learning. Because God is trying to teach every one of you something new every day. I'll never forget that. 
And so what is it, what is it about children that Jesus was saying that we must become like them to enter into the kingdom? The answer comes from the child's mindset. Most children, their minds, their brains are still growing. And that is why they are so malleable, meaning their brains are so able to be formed and fixed, like, like, like having a, a Play-Doh in your hand. You can mold it the way you want it to. But think about the person who is old and set in their ways, and they're sedentary. They're like, ah, oh, I don't need to learn this stuff. I'm older than you were ever born. You know, whatever. I, you know, they would say things like, um, anyway, forget it. I, I, don't, I don't have this. So I'm not going to go through. But you know those men and women, right, who are just so set in their ways. Forget about age now. But they're just so set in their ways, and they know everything, and they're like, yeah, I know. You don't have to teach me anything. They're the hardest to lead. It's difficult to lead people like that. But the person who has an open hand and says, God, I don't know everything. I still need you. I, I don't have all the answers, and I'm trusting in you. That's the humble person that God, with an open hand, that God can take with his hand and says, you know what? Come, follow me. I'll teach you. So the challenge that I have for everyone this morning is what areas in our own lives, they could be cultural, societal, experiential, or even personal. What areas in our lives are, are hindered because of a fixed mindset? Is there something that we believe that, oh, I know this is right, and we have that clenched fist against God and saying, I know what's best for me, God, so you better give it to me. That's why he doesn't answer those prayers. But is this an invitation from the Lord to change to a growth mindset where we open up our clenched fist and we open our hands and we say, God, I want you to lead me. I'm broken. I'm blind. I'm more blind than this blind man was. I need your help. I need you to save me. It is in that mindset that I truly believe people will experience God's restorative work in their lives. When people are humble enough to say, God, I need you, and you are the only one that can help me. May we have that posture this morning, today. All right, Abby, as Abby comes up, why don't we pray, asking the Lord, is there anything in our hearts? Is there anything that we have in our lives that are a clenched fist that we don't want to give to God at this moment, and we say, oh, God, I, I know what's best for me. I don't want you to come into that part of my life. I know how you work. Is there something in our lives that are still closed off from God? And if there is, I'm not here to shame you, or I'm not here to embarrass us. I have many times a closed fist against God myself. And many times he has to show me through humility of how to open my hands and say, God, I need you to lead me. So, Father, if there's anyone like that this morning here today, Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, to see that if there's areas that are closed off to you this morning, Father, we ask that you would open them by the power of your Holy Spirit that only you can do so that your restorative, 
your restoration can start to happen in our lives. Father, we invite you, Holy Spirit, into our hearts so that you may speak and have your way in your people. We open our hands to you. Would you lead us? Would you guide us and be our God? Thank you.